welcome to another edition of the UK Law Week podcast with me, your host, Marcus Cleaver. This week we're going to be looking at the case of the Crown against McKinley, and the citation for this case is 2018 UKSC 42. And for this episode, I want to take you back to the 2015 general election. The Conservative Party's return to power had been only a mitigated success. George Osborne's policy of austerity had guided the country out of the aftermath of the global financial crisis, but the electorate was starting to become restless with the first coalition government since the Second World War. In particular, the European Union was a key issue, and so in order to shore up support, David Cameron promised an in-out referendum on the subject. Now, when researching this episode, I haven't really looked beyond 2015, so don't spoil it for me, but I'm guessing that nothing much came out of that referendum in the end. Anyway, as campaigning carries on apace in 2015, one of the key battlegrounds was clearly going to be the constituency of South Thanet. On one side, Craig McKinley was standing for the Conservative Party after the former MP for the area, Laura Sandys, had stepped down for personal reasons. Sandys had always been staunchly pro-EU, but McKinley had formerly been the deputy leader of the UK Independence Party, or UKIP for short. Speaking of UKIP, the other main candidate in this election was a little-known politician from that party called Nigel Farage, who had by this point become one of the leading political voices in the UK, despite never having held a seat in the House of Commons. Campaigning was relentless as the Tories shipped volunteers into the area by the busload, while Farage had the opportunity to speak during a leaders' debate televised across the nation. Even comedian Al Murray, also known as the pub landlord, stood for election and campaigned to revalue the pound at £1.10 so that it would be worth more. In the run-up to the final vote on the 7th of May, Local polls swung wildly between either a large victory for UKIP or a narrow win for the Conservatives. Once the votes were counted, it was actually a fairly comfortable victory for McKinley, as he was returned as the Member of Parliament by a margin of almost 3,000 votes. Why then is this race relevant to a legal podcast in 2018? Well, unlike our cousins over in America, the UK has very strict rules about how elections are run, and in particular how they are financed. A subsequent investigation by Channel 4 News found that spending on things like accommodation for those Conservative Party volunteers we mentioned earlier had not been declared on a national level, and there were open questions about whether those expenses should also have been declared at a local level as well. Kent Police investigated and it was eventually decided that McKinley, his election agent and a party activist, should be charged with criminal offences relating to the Representation of the People Act 1983. The specific offence we will be focusing on is knowingly making false declarations in relation to election expenses. Before the case went to trial, there was a point of law that was considered to be of general public importance, and that is why it has made its way to the Supreme Court. To be more specific, the question is whether goods or services, etc., that are provided for a candidate at a discount are only considered to be election expenses if they are actually authorised by the candidate or their agent. The Court of Appeal held that such authorisation was required in order for the expense to be subject to a declaration under the Representation of the People Act 1983, and it is on that basis that the question was appealed to the Supreme Court where we pick it up. The justices got stuck into section 90C of the Act where the relevant information is contained and noted that this requires three questions to be asked. Firstly, were the goods or services provided either free of charge or for a discount of 10% or more? Secondly, did the candidate or someone acting on their behalf make use of the goods or services? Thirdly, are these the sort of expenses that fall under the jurisdiction of the Representation of the People Act 1983? If the answer to all of these questions is yes, then the expense is considered to have been incurred by the candidate for the purposes of the Act. Lord Hughes gave the lead judgment and pointed out that nowhere in those three questions is there an explicit mention of authorisation of the expenses by the candidate, and whether it is required or not. 
It may be true that authorization is something that is commonly required by the Act, but that does not mean that it is a prerequisite for every provision, as Section 90C demonstrates. This is further emphasised by provisions such as 90ZA that take effect subject to 90C, and are therefore distinct in their requirements. The legal decision in this case therefore proved to be rather straightforward in the end, and it was clear that the Supreme Court was not going to budge on the issue. This begs the question as to why the respondents brought the case in the first place. In my view, I think they were hoping the justices would take a more lenient approach, as opposed to a strict interpretation of the Act. This is because the current wording, with its interpretation confirmed by the Supreme Court, means that an election candidate or agent could potentially commit a criminal act without having authorised the expense in the first place. The argument follows that this surely could not have been Parliament's intention, and therefore the courts should step in to correct the path that the law is taking in this situation. While the Court of Appeal obliged, it was clear that the Supreme Court was not prepared to make this leap, and the reason that they give probably strikes the right balance between interpreting the law and a sense of natural justice. First of all, it is not really for the courts to step in and essentially alter the law that Parliament has handed down. Admittedly, judges will on occasion step in to offer a liberal interpretation that does almost have the effect of altering the legislation, but that is much less likely to happen when dealing with criminal law, and in particular the elements that constitute an actual offence itself. The second point is that the representation of the People Act 1983 does almost seem to account for this issue. For example, the more serious offence of knowingly making false declarations would require dishonesty as part of the mens rea, which would obviate any need for authorization by the defendant. Meanwhile, the lesser offences may be strict liability and not require any mental element whatsoever, but Section 86 does provide a relief from sanctions when the accused has acted in good faith, and so there is a certain flexibility in the law that is built in. Overall, these reasons mean that while a disinclination towards flexibility may seem harsh on the surface, there was always a solid basis for allowing this appeal. Finally, before I go, I do just also want to mention that this is currently an ongoing trial, and so that's why I'm not really commenting on the specifics of the case itself and how this decision may impact on McKinley and the other defendants, but do keep an eye on the news and see how the trial progresses. Anyway, that's all from me this week, so thanks as always to bensound.com who provide the theme music, and thanks to you of course for listening and tuning in as always. Special thanks this week also go to Lauren Law 2018 who has left a very kind review of the podcast on iTunes. Remember, you can leave your own rating and review there and have your name writ- read out on the podcast as well. I'll be back with another episode next week, but for now, bye!